I expect that those of you who are African, when you saw this program and the title of my uh, presentation, if you want to call it that, got apprehensive. And I can quite understand why you'd get apprehensive. I also went through a lot of self-examination because I was aware that what I was proposing to speak about would be considered as washing dirty laundry in public. So I was also concerned, but at the end I decided that the cost to our continent for hiding this dirty laundry in the closet is too high, and that we had better start confronting that reality. So I want to take you through my perception of what's going on. Why are we, in the modern world, enslaving ourselves? What are the characteristics that lead to this? My experience of my continent, and maybe I need to upfront tell you that I'm Zimbabwean, and I suppose that from everything you've read and read about, Zimbabwe tends to be on the extreme of the problem countries on our continent. But I dare say that I don't think Zimbabwe is in that box on its own. True, not all African countries are in that extreme, but I would suggest to you that the majority of African countries display what I'm going to tell you. Most of our countries, in the way they are administered, the way they run their affairs, uh, are full of nepotism, full of patronage, and these two things lead to lack of meritocracy in the administration of our public lives. And lack of meritocracy automatically also unfortunately leads to lack of performance management. So this is a characterization, but more importantly, we need to start looking through or looking at how the world experiences us and then reacts to that experience. So as the world experiences us, as we send people out there in the world, in particular through the public sector, through diplomacy, through the representatives we send to international organizations such as the World Bank, the IMF, the FDB, and the UN, what do they see? I have been to Washington. I worked at the World Bank, at IFC. I've been to Tunis. I worked in the AFDB. And I must hasten to point out, I was not an appointee or a nominee of my government. I went there independently. What the world experiences as we send these representatives out there are people who are lazy, people who are unimaginative, and totally uninnovative. Because these people are not sent there on the basis of deserving to be sent there. They are sent there because mostly they are related to whoever is running the country and whoever is part of the administration. That's how they make their way to these places. So the world experiences this. And naturally, as you know, action leads to reaction. How does the world, after experiencing us this way, then react? Unsurprisingly, they lose respect for us because we are not credible. We don't send credible representatives. They become patronizing. They stop listen, listening to us because our voice is not worth listening to, especially as represented by the people we send. That's how the world experiences us and then reacts. Guess what follows then? Unfortunately, there is action and reaction and then reaction yet again. So we experiencing what I think is justified reaction from the world, then react to that reaction. How do we react? We feel ignored. We feel not respected. We externalize the effects on what is going on in our environment. We attribute everything that goes on in our space to the action, actions of other people. And in the process, what we are not aware of is that in that process, we're disempowering ourselves. Essentially, what we're saying is, 
our space is managed by other people. Listen to any government. When you ask them questions about underperformance in their country, they will find an external reason every single time. It's because somebody has done this. It's because of colonization. It's because of slavery. It goes on and on and on. The truth is that it is easier to name countries that have never been colonized than those that have been colonized, because pretty well everybody has been colonized at one point or other. But isn't it surprising that it's only African countries that have stayed fixated on what the others have done wrongly to them. And they continue to use this as a reason for not moving on and managing their environment more successfully. So we, we then spend lots of money. Like I say, we send people to everywhere where we can send them. And what is fascinating is that we don't seem to have the intelligence to understand that actually we've got no voice. We can send lots of people to the UN, but they don't have a reason to listen to us. What they do because of political correctness is to humor us. They give us a space, they give us a chair, but they don't listen to us because we're not worth listening to. Because our contribution does not come from a point of credibility. If we're credible, the only way you get credible is to run your own space properly and successfully. There are no exceptions. If you look at the evolution of especially the Eastern countries, they are where they are today, and they've got a seat at the table because they've run their own countries successfully. Begrudgingly or otherwise, the world is accommodating them. The same path is going to have to be followed by us. But you may very well ask and say, but where, how does this all lead to self-enslavement. The most critical element about this problem is how our children experience the world we've created. Our children grow up seeing a space that is run totally incompetently. Look at our schools, look at our hospitals, look, look at our infrastructure. At every turn, what they experience is things that are not run properly. And we reinforce that by taking them when, they are, when we need them to go to school and we can afford it, where do we send them? We don't send them to our own institutions because we know they are no good. When they, our families fall sick, where do we send them? We cannot send them to our own institutions because we know they are not, not any good. So, inadvertently, we are actually colonizing our own children in a manner that is much, much worse than anybody ever did. Because the perception we've created in their minds is that the world we run is not worth belonging to. Because no good comes out of it. And if, if Fred is in the audience, please excuse me, Fred, understand I'm talking statistical significance. So institutions like the Africa leadership, either academy or university or college, I think belong in a tiny, tiny minority. And I think the tragedy for me is that when I come to these institutions, I experience an interaction with amazing young people. Amazing. They are as good as you will find anywhere in the world. But guess what? They will never find a space in the countries that we run. They're not going to be accommodated there. As a result, they will end up going to sell their skills elsewhere. They will have no opportunity to build the countries that we need to be built. Lastly, so all of us, most Africans, come from a background of having been abused by a colonial system or slavery, if you like. But this issue, because it was external to us, was much easier to identify. And because it was easier to identify, we could actually come up with an antidote, if you like. We could deal with it, and that's why we are where we are today. The challenge we face is that self-enslavement 
is much more subtle because it's internal to us. And so it's easier for us to stay in the space of denial because it's not external, it's not easy to identify. It's, it's, it's more, we, we sort of blame, to, we externalize the reasons and we stay in denial. As a result, the danger of us not fixing this is very high. It's not going to be as easy as fighting an external enemy. This is an internal enemy. And for me, we need now to really think through the issue of, do we want to have private conversations amongst ourselves and therefore conform to not washing our dirty laundry in public? Or is this sufficiently serious for us to make it a public issue? Thank you very much.